Good afternoon. Welcome to the July Living with Disability Research Centre seminar, um, which is part of our series during the year. Um, if you haven't joined us before, um, we've got two speakers this afternoon. Um, so they'll each have an hour. Uh, each will speak for about half an hour, and then there'll be lots of opportunity to ask questions or make comments. If you want to ask or make a comment, please use the Q&A function and we'll be able to ask the question on your behalf. Um, all the, the, the presentations will be recorded and they'll, that recording will be available up on our website um, probably by the end of the week or early next week, as will people's slides. So you'll be able to look at it again if you need to or share it with other people. So this afternoon, we've got two presenters um, who are both from uh, the Summer Foundation and associated with the Living with Disability Research Centre through the partnership that we have with the Summer Foundation. Um, in some ways, they're quite different presentations, but in other ways, they're, they're quite connected um, in the, the first one is about support coordination, which is a sort of fundamental glue that sticks a lot of other things together. Um, and this is one of the first studies, I think, that's really looked in depth at um, support coordination and what it does and what the outcomes for people are from support coordination in the context of the, the NDIS. So the first presentation is from Sharon, Dr. Sharon McDonald, who's a senior research fellow at the Summer Foundation, um, who has a background in, um, as she says, issues management and change management uh, for organisations and was previously a senior lecturer um, at Deakin University. So I'm going to hand over to you, Sharon. Welcome. And um, you can off you go and speak for as long as you like, probably half an hour or so, and then we'll have some questions. So if you've got questions, please put them in the Q&A. So over to you, Sharon. Great, thanks. Um, as as uh, Chris said, I'm Sharon McDonald, and I'm presenting this on behalf of a much larger research team, um, including Jacinta, who helped conceptualise the actual research itself. And these are just preliminary findings at this stage, but there's some interesting findings to share in today's presentation. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, and I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So thank you very much for joining. Um, before we actually um, go into what we've located in terms of support coordination. I'm just going to provide a little bit of context about the problem that we felt we needed to address. And this particular slide is addressing that in that we have NDIS participants who need to navigate the scheme and support coordinators are essential in helping them navigate the scheme, understand the language and ultimately um, choose, uh, have choice and control. But finding those skilled, experienced support coordinators is a challenge and there is still a limited understanding in terms of what the demands are of support coordinators, what skills they need, what attributes they should have, and of course the operating environment in which they work. So before launching into what sort of problems they face or what makes a good support coordinator, I've just got a slide up here which talks about from the NDIA perspective, what it is support coordinators should do as part of their role. And in blue are level one coordination activities. So, so at the very basic level, this is what a support coordinator would do with their client. And then of course in black, um, level two and level three. So I'll go through those levels in a moment. But as you can see, firstly, it's helping an NDIS participant understand their plan which is the first and one of the most important things. Um, the next one there is connecting with supports and whether that's connecting with support workers, transport links, um, employment help, mobility aids, etc. So support coordinators are there to help find these NDIA, NDIA funded support services. And then, of course, connecting them with such supports, and they are the link or the liaison between the NDIS participants and the providers. And they help set up um, agreements, service agreements with such providers. 
Um, one of the other important things that level one coordination involves as well is report writing and they have to complete an eight week plan, which ultimately outlines what the support coordinator has done to help the NDIS participant start their new plan. Um, then a midterm implementation report. So like a progress report and then um, a final report or a planned reassessment, which looks at what are the recommendations for the next plan. Now, as you can see there in black, there's another couple of important ones, such as building the capacity and resilience of the NDIS participant. And this is, starts to lean in towards trying to ensure the participant can manage their own plan, understand the language and build up some capacity and resilience and independence so that they can um, learn the language, manage their own plan and maintain a reliable set of supports. Ultimately, things can go wrong. Um, providers drop off and you need to find new providers. So crisis planning is also a really important factor and helping um, manage risk assessment and um, ready to overcome any barriers that they may face there. So I did mention that there are the three levels of support coordination and level one is per hour, as you can see there, it's providing those items that I mentioned in blue and that they are charged $70 per hour. And level two, all of those tasks, and in addition, help building the capacity and maintaining relationships with supports and monitoring those supports. And level three requires a little bit more skill and experience from the support coordinator, and it's helping participants with those more complex situations. And as you can see, the rate is 190 when you're looking at level three coordination. So this brings us back to the research questions that we were seeking to address, and that was what are the challenges and barriers that support coordinators face in their operating environment? What makes a good support coordinator and what would help them to be a more effective workforce is that third question. In order to address these questions, started with a small content analysis of job advertisements, but the primary focus of this study was to conduct semi-structured interviews of which we used Braun and Clark's reflexive thematic analysis to analyze the transcripts. Just beginning though with those job advertisements, um, we, I did a snapshot on the 11th of April, just one day, every job advert that talked about support coordination and there were 342 of those, but according to the NDIS or NDIA definition of support coordination, narrowed it down to 65. And this was just to provide a bit of a snapshot about what minimum qualifications did employers seek? Um, what did they want support coordinators to do? What sort of qualities or attributes they felt were important? And of course, the salary. So you can see there that um, there was 37% didn't state what particular qualification they were after and the same amount, 37% did want or sought somebody with a degree. Um, and then of course the certificate four and three were seeking people in disability, youth work, mental health or community services. And the fields of study were primarily allied health with regards to the degree, um, but then they break it down further saying or disability or community relevant or related. So they're pretty flexible in what sorts of background they sought or support coordinators. And the salary could depend on experience. We've got entry level at 50,000 through to specialized support coordination at about 91,000. And in terms of experience, they were seeking anybody from the entry level at about six months if possible. A, a lot of the wording was ideally through to um, five years experience was the largest amount of experience they were seeking. And there were five ad advertisements that saw, that said that lived experience would be um, desirable. Going back to what they sought, so this slide looks at the various tasks that they wanted them to do. And of course, it really connects with that very first um, NDIA slide about what was important for a level one coordinator to do and establishing supports and services was high on high uh, 78%, followed by establishing supports and understanding the plan 
reporting to the NDIA and building capacity. So they were the top ones that emerged from that particular content analysis. In terms of qualities and attributes, you'll see there that there was some very important were interpersonal skills and whether that was um, showing emotional intelligence or empathy through to good communication skills, whether verbal or nonverbal. Having good disability and NDIS knowledge was really important and the capacity to build trusting positive relationships and having good organisational skills and of course business acumen was were all really important attributes they were seeking in candidates. So that was really good at informing us what employers sought and then we moved on to looking at um, this, the interviews themselves. And as you can see, we had 55 interviews that we've conducted. And for the support coordinators, of which there were 20, they represented small, medium and large organisations. And there were some independent employed support coordinators as well. And big thanks to the generosity of all the interviewees who took their time to share their support coordination experiences. And as you can see, we gained multiple perspectives in doing that. Um, the interviews took place from July 2022 through to April this year and occurred via phone or Zoom and the average time was 54 minutes. As you can see from the map there, there was some pretty good distribution, the, obviously a dominance in New South Wales and Victoria, but many people across Australia responded to the recruitment note, which was great. The other ideal thing that we had is that there was a distribution across rural and metro. So as you can see the breakdown there across the states, we had some good representation from rural areas. The NDIS participants we interviewed were broad in age from 30 to 63 years of age. And we did ask them, how many hours of disability support do you receive per week? And as you can see there from the slide it's they some people didn't have any hours and other people needed 24 7 care when asked how many hours of support coordination did people receive per year they the, the range was 20 to 100 hours and 20 is equivalent to getting the level one support coordination When we broke down the qualifications and background of support coordinators, which was really interesting as a comparison to the, what employers sought. Um, so employers, they had a 37%, they wanted people with a degree or higher. Um, whereas the people that were participants in our study, there was 85% had a bachelor's degree or higher. So that was an interesting representation of the highest level of education. And of course, the fields of study are really broad, as you can see from the slide. Um, again, there was uh, a lot of um, variety in what the employers sought, but here it represents the same in that they wanted people with allied health backgrounds. But um, as you can see, that was represented, but so was business management and so on. So a really strong um, representation there of different disciplines. So then of course we asked, what the challenges were. So this it goes down to what were the challenges and barriers that support coordinators, coordinators faced. We didn't just ask support coordinators, we asked everybody what they felt were the biggest challenges and barriers. And these listed here, I'm going to expand on each one in the next few slides, but as a summary, burnout, caseloads and funding were a big problem. Um, misconceptions of the role, and you'll see that that's broken down um, across various organisations and people, abuse that they faced, staff shortages in rural locations and NDIA hindrances. So taking one at a time, um, the first one there, burnout and caseloads and funding. So um, there's quite a high turnover. People do get burnt out quite quickly. There was various um, figures exposed from six months to two years as in terms of how long people last in the profession. Um, a lot of the problem can occur when support coordinators are, are listening to problems, taking it on, not knowing how to help themselves in terms of putting up those barriers and looking after their well-being. Ultimately, they don't want to let the NDIS participant down. So 
when they run out of hours, the participant not having enough hours for support coordination, they don't just abandon them, they just work pro bono. So it has a knock on effect to the support coordinator who is continually overworked, not getting paid for it. And sometimes that also results in them picking up more clients to earn an income so that they, and it just spreads their load across too many different clients and therefore the caseload is quite high. Then there's some misconceptions of the role. And as you can see there, it's broken down into the various expectations held by the NDAA itself, the participants and their family members, allied health professionals and employers. So everybody's got a bit of uh, expectations on what the support coordinator role should contain. On the right there is the slide that I showed at the beginning, which talks about what the NDIA lists as the support coordinating role. But we need to add in the travel that support coordinators have and then the meeting itself, reading reports and identifying that the reports aren't good enough and having to go back to the allied health professional and ask them to, to rewrite it. Um, the, if you are a registered support coordinator, all the auditing that you go through, um, you're not allowed to be an advocate, so you have to have measured advocacy and decide how much support can you give an NGIS participant before you've overstepped. Um, dealing with delayed decisions, dealing with KPIs, there's a whole lot of additional things that we can add to that blue box there. And then, of course, it's when things go wrong. So you're dealing with putting out fires all the time. And as one participant said, when the phone rings 95% of the time, it's because there's a problem that you need to fix. So the, the other thing I mentioned KPIs is that um, a lot of organizations just, they get a referral, they take on a new client and it stretches the support coordinator a bit thinner. I mentioned abuse. Now for a support coordinator themselves, abuse is in terms of the verbal abuse they receive. So when people are phoning them, sometimes they're very angry and abusive and physical threats. So that's where people are, um, you know, put fists to their face or grabbing items to hit them. Um, abuse of the system, slightly different in that people were reporting rogue support workers and the people who are not regulated, um, unregistered and don't understand restrictive practices. They, there's some um, terrible stories about how they breach professional boundaries and don't have any accountability. So. You know, that's not, um, not everybody, but it's some of the support workers that support coordinators had encountered. Um, and then, of course, some support coordinators themselves, in terms of a conflict of interest, um, will send participants to very specific services um, that might be their friends. Um, and sometimes they ask for providers to give them a bit of a kickback as a finder's fee, and that's another problem that's there, but they justify that in their offsetting the low pay that they receive. And sometimes employers will channel, um, use the support coordination service that they have to channel participants through to their actual services as well. So there's a few conflicts of interest that take place. And I did mention before, there are shortages in rural locations of allied health, and that makes it really difficult for a support coordinator to connect an NDIS participant with an allied health professional. But equally, NDIS participants were explaining the difficulties they have when living in a rural location to get support coordination, especially if in their funding, they had very low support coordination, like 20 hours or so because support coordinators are starting to choose people with level two or above um, rather than the low number of hours because of that whole dilemma of how much can you achieve in 20 hours and then adding in the fact that it's a rural location. And then of course, this is a very long list, lots and lots of quotes associated with NDIA hindrances. Um, to sum up the first three there, um, Somebody did say, sometimes up to 50% of my time is just fixing NDIA stuff ups. So, you know, that, this is where a lot of the time goes. Um, sadly, some of the behaviours that, that support coordinators face can be where planners are berating them in front of their clients. And sometimes the planners can be a little arrogant or misinformed. 
and if a support coordinator chooses to correct them um, they have to make a decision do i correct the planner and tell them that something's changed within the ndis um, it's will they then cut the funding for the ndis participant it's that balance of, of not upsetting the ndia planner there are constant changes as well uh, everybody is confused even the ndia staff that answer the phone is what people have said turnover is high within the ndia answers differ um, the rules are constantly changing they're not well written they're not clear they're not step by step and one participant just said it's no wonder my support coordinator really struggles in communicating decisions because you, know, you don't really get a clear answer as, as what they had determined um, the NDIA is also reportedly keeping things close to their chests and aren't very transparent with their information. Misconceptions, again, that comes back to the expectations, um, but it's hard to know what the NDIA expects and therefore that's part of the problem. Um, people have to take on high, high caseloads and then they're putting out those spot fires, as I mentioned before, which takes up a lot of their time. Um, and then of course, they work pro bono. And one of the participants in the interviews did say, the unfortunate thing is the NDIA are starting to expect that we will take on pro bono work once the funding runs out. So that's a problem in itself. And then of course, there were many um, quotes about the frustrations that participants find, um, waiting six months for plans, not replying to emails, um, having to relive trauma, within an NDIA planning meeting um, in order to get the funding that they require. And then the family frustrations of they ring the NDIA and they say they'll call them back, but they don't. So one quote to summarize the NDIA was strap yourself in by and fly by the seat of your pants type stuff. Um, another, it's a bit of a challenge, but it's also a skill that coordinators have is having all of this knowledge. So they need to have knowledge within all of these domains and it's linked back to what support coordinators need to be able to do and that they need to be able to navigate the NDIS. Um, if they are trying to help uh, NDIS participant get into a new house, into a specialist disability accommodation, um, they need to have knowledge of how to navigate that process. They need disability knowledge and a lot of participants just are asked if they take on a new client, they need to learn about my disability and have some knowledge of what, how that is impacting my life. So having that knowledge, that willingness to obtain that knowledge is also just as important. Because the NDIS doesn't fund medical conditions, it's important that the support coordinator knows what the differences are and what the NDIS will fund. And then of course, having that local knowledge and connections and one of the negatives that will come up was that people will like support coordinators to offset the burden and take on some of the work that they've had to do. So instead of going and sourcing their own connections, they're asking the support coordinator to do that. So having that wealth of knowledge of what's out there and what would fit best with you is really important. Um, and some support coordinators have been known to just Google, look at Google reviews, and that essentially is not what uh, NDIS participant or their family members are after. And of course, having cultural competence is really important as well. So there's this slide just really embraces the negatives that people experienced about support coordination. And then we'll flip it to look at what good factors uh, support coordinators do have. But ultimately, one of the biggest problems that people were expressing was that anybody can do it. So we look back at what the employers were seeking anybody can become a support coordinator if they want if they don't want to go down the registration path um, so that one person said they can wake up tomorrow and be a support coordinator nobody is checking and nobody is watching um, so the other problems linked to that is that some people see it as a, an opportunity just to make money they don't particularly want to do it which is an interesting one because there's a lot of people suffering burnout um, but some people do enter it um, with the intention of making money. And sometimes there's an element of over-promising and under-delivering and therefore funds are being exhausted. And as people waste funds, um, they are taking it out of 
out of the person's budget, um, not providing invoices or statements. Um, and so therefore when challenged, your options are potentially get a new support coordinator. But the problem with that is the original support coordinator has exhausted many of your funds in the initial setting up of things and you, you essentially start again. Um, as I mentioned before, many people seek to um, have the burden lifted, but many people are finding that they're ending up doing it themselves anyway. So the problem with that is people who are family members who are aging that really do need the support coordinator to lift the burden because um, they don't feel that they'll be able to keep doing this in future. Um, so they really do need to have a good support coordinator that will, is prepared to pick up all of those factors. Um, I mentioned before about conflicts of interest, which is linked there to favouring providers. Um, but also confidentiality is a real problem in that um, people are aware that somebody needs a new provider. Instead of giving them a small sample of what it is they need, they give them the whole plan. And NDIS participants are really unhappy that um, their private information is being shared so freely. And linked to lack of confidentiality, there's another problem in that support coordinators who are unregistered, what are they doing with the case notes? Um, because again, it's who's watching um, and where is that information going? In terms of what makes a good support coordinator, we can almost flip what we've just talked about. And good support coordinators take the time to understand the person with a disability and look up what their disability is, learn more about it so they can really understand what it is they're going through, what they need, what will be the best connection for them. They seek to solve problems. So this comes back to having really good interpersonal skills. Um, providing measured advocacy, which is something I mentioned before. Having that breadth of interpersonal skills, there was a long list of qualities that people would like, but they could be grouped into those interpersonal skills. And maintaining, building and maintaining professional relationships, it's really important to be able to talk to allied health and talk to all the providers that you need within your community and maintaining those relationships, knowing what would work for that individual. And of course, some, some support coordinators were inaccessible, um, unresponsive. And so for a good support coordinator to, to be available, responsive, accessible, answer the phone. There were some examples where um, support coordinators would kind of be missing in action until they needed something from an allied health professional and then demand the report straight away. So things like that, if a working together to make sure that people know timelines and know when things are needed. And of course, if something is needed unexpectedly, if they've got that good relationship, it's, it's less problematic. When asked what would help the support coordination workforce to be more effective, um, well-being and preventing that burnout is really important. And there are some really good employers that have that top of mind and have some well-being um, programs in place for their employees. Um, then, of course, some are really working hard to ensure their knowledge remains up to date. There is a problem with that in one respect in that that can be quite expensive, especially for the small organisations or for the independent support coordinators. So that links us to that actual fourth point there as to how can we provide the standardised training? And one person said it would be great if the NDIS just took that over and um, came up with a course that they could then host. So that was one really good suggestion. But everybody did agree that standardised training and regular professional development offered to support coordinators was really crucial. Um, mentoring and support networks were really important. Um, many people spoke of sharing resources, having great relationships with their allied health teams. Um, social media was also mentioned as a really good way of connecting with each other and there was one social media platform that was um, dedicated to self-care for support coordinators but conversely we need to know that there are some where support coordinators go on and they're basically being marketed to, to by service providers who want their business um, and there's a little bit of misinformation out there as well that needs to be regulated when considering social media outlets. 
Um, but communities of practice is another good option with regards to that. So as we go back to the research questions, uh, it's really important that organisations and the NDIA understand the burnout, the high caseloads, the difficult caseloads, um, the hindrances caused by the NDIA and the trauma that people have. These are all important things to know when considering what a support coordinator workforce needs to help them with their resources and, and what sort of care is required. And also we know that a good support coordinator um, has those effective communication skills, they're good collaborators. And of course, um, it's important that there's a collaborative approach to build and sustain the support coordination workforce. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There's a lot of food for thought there, some of which is really disturbing. Um, and I think it just brings together a, a lot of the sort of misgivings that a lot of people already have about support coordination. So thank you. That was really interesting. Okay, so I think Jacinta Douglas needs very little introduction to most people. <laughs> Uh, Jacinta now works uh, as a consultant for the Summer Foundation, uh, but is also an emeritus professor with La Trobe University and the Living with Disability Research Centre. And she's been working in this field for a long time, particularly with people with acquired brain injury. And she's been doing a study now for quite some time about people moving into individualised supported accommodation, individualised apartment so she's going to present some of the early findings of pre and post and a bit further post moves for some people so over to you Jacinta. Thank you Chris. Okay so what we're going to look at today is, is actually the results of two studies one of them looking at a comparison of pre-move findings and post-move findings, and the other one looking over time at comparisons of pre-move, 12-month findings, and two-year findings. So getting a sense of how things are progressing after that first early period when you make a move into supported disability accommodation. So when I talk about home and housing for um, people with disability, I always like to start with asking you as audience members to think about, just take a few seconds to think about what home means to you. What are the three things or two things that come to mind when you think about home? So I'll give you those seconds to just have a bit of a think. It's not all that difficult. So I'm going to move on and, and say to you that, that for years and years, people have thought about what are the most important or what are the characteristics of home? And even very famous people like Jane Austen said, there is nothing like staying at home for real comfort. Good old William Shakespeare even said, people usually are the happiest at home. And G.K. Chesterton said, the truth is that the home is the only place of liberty. And I often think about those three constructs. The fact that home is associated with comfort, with happiness and freedom. And I think for me that acts as such an important backdrop to the fact that having a place we call home is such an important support with respect to our lives. So not surprisingly then, adequate housing is universally viewed as one of humanity's most basic needs. 
Our home and our living arrangements have a really strong influence on our quality of life. And research affirms those links between housing, health outcomes and quality of life for people with disability. A substantial number of people, however, with significant disabilities have been denied access to their own home and have limited choice in housing and living arrangements. So there's a lot of work to do when you think about comfort, freedom, you think about what goes with having your home. So the goal of this project is to systematically investigate the experience, the outcomes and economic impact of people with disability moving into specialist disability accommodation of their choosing. The constructs that we're looking at here are health, well-being, community participation and support outcomes as well as the lived experience of people with disability um, measured before moving and over two years after they move. And we're doing this now with the support of an ARC linkage grant, which really helps, I must say. So today, I'm going to look at the pilot study that we conducted and the results of that pilot study and a longitudinal case series that goes up to two years post move. The aim of the pilot study was to investigate post-move change and outcomes for people with disability and complex needs who moved into individualised housing that had appropriate design for their needs, that had support available for them, technology where necessary, and was located in um, a positive, if you like, location that had amenities and was, was actually accessible for people with disability. Our hypotheses were that after moving into an individualised housing option, participants would experience improvements in health, so their overall self-rated health, well-being, and community integration. And there's no data out there at all to support whether or not if you're in a home of your own choosing with appropriate supports built into it, whether you may have a change in, in the level of support you require. So that's an exploratory, if you like, aim. Does support change when you move into specialist disability accommodation that's individualised to meet your needs as well as much as possible? The longitudinal case study has similar, uh, similar if you like, aims, that is to compare pre-move outcomes. But this time, instead of just looking at post-move at six months, we actually followed people up for one year and then for two years to make those comparisons. And again, looking at people with um, neurological disability and complex needs. Um, our hypotheses were again that we would see some reliable improvements in those measures, health, wellbeing, community integration at one and two years after moving. And again, we, we, we weren't sure whether it would continue to grow, whether it would grow quickly, whether it would grow slowly, whether it would actually deteriorate. So getting a sense of what's happening at the individual level is really important, I think, as we all know. So the pilot study then um, looks like this, and this is the method. It's a mixed method study. We have qualitative um, in-depth interviews where we evaluate individual experiences where the person needs support to communicate. They can have a support person present. We're able to use all of the, the communication assistive de devices um, that are available to the person we have people qualified across that whole range of skill levels to be able to work with us on within those interviews. And then we have four outcome measures that we use quantitatively. Um, the first one is the um, EQ5D, the visual analog scale, which allows a person to indicate on a scale from zero to 100 what their health rating is from their own perspective. We use the wellbeing scale that's developed, the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which is a lovely scale because it actually, um, it has 14 items and those items are, are expressed in a positive direction, not necessarily in a negative direction. 
Um, community integration, we use the community integration questionnaire revised, the Australian data with that. We also have Australian data for the EQ5D um, that we can compare with from a normative pers perspective. And we measured support needs using the care and needs scale um, developed by Robin Tate, which allows you to identify the number of hours of support a person needs on a weekly basis. Two time points here. Time point one was pre-move. So the person actually um, reported on their pre-move experience of home and time true was post-move and with a minimum of six months. So the demographics of these 15 participants, you can see here an average age of 44 with a range of 20 to 67. Um, the majority were female, 60%. Disability type um, ranged across cerebral palsy, three participants acquired brain injury, two others like ataxias multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and other, which was a range of congenital um, disorders, mostly um, inherited in some ways or due to um, birth trauma in, in some people. So a range of disability types. Pre-move housing environment again shows a range. Um, shared supported accommodation of uh, in in environments with less than ten people sharing, and that was just over a quarter of the group. A private home with partner and or children, a fifth of the group, three people. Private home living with parents or relatives, again another fifth of our participants. Residential aged care were two participants in this pilot study, um, people who were in vulnerable housing, who were at risk of losing housing, one person shared supported accommodation of more than 10 participants, again, one person, and one person was living in their own home alone. That person, just to, to give you a little bit of context, was somebody with a degenerative disorder who recognised that they could no longer continue to do that. Um, and the home environment if you like, the building environment wasn't um, able to support them to do that. So let's look at some results. And you don't need to really see the statistics to recognise the change here. The pre-move is in the orange and the post-move post or the post-intervention, um, if you like, is in the yellow. And this is the EQ5D health rating. And that goes from a mean of 45 up to um, nearly 60, 60 on that zero to 100 scale. Wellbeing also shows a significant improvement at post-move. You can see here it actually um, ranges, quite, shows quite a difference. And if we statistically analyse these and we used paired sample t-tests that means that the person is really compared with themselves and the pairs uh, are compared over time and you can see here the the pre-move scores with their standard deviation post-move scores and whether or not it was significant well our health rating um, showed a trend towards significance we used two tail tests because although we hypothesized there would be improvement we didn't have a lot of data to, to actually support that. So we used a two-tail test um, and, showed a and showed a trend towards significance for improvement. Wellbeing, on the other hand, was a very straightforward, um, positive, statistically significant change. And both of these measures showed what's called a large effect, which is probably more important. It means it's an effect that you would be able to experience in your life or you would have really significant consequences when there's a large effect on a particular measure. If we look at community integration, community, the, the actual scale gives you a total score, which you can see here on the left. And you can see here that community integration is, is particularly low prior to moving. And there's quite a significant change post-move or a large change, I should say. I'll show you the significance in a moment. 
The thing to remember about this measure is it has four subscales. And if you look at just the graph here, you'll see that the subscale that showed the most change was this one designated with HI, which is home integration. That is measuring things like having some independence in your own home, that um, measures things like participating in, in home-like activities, you know, making your shopping list, planning to cook what you want, all of those sorts of things. So they're home-based, if you like, activities and changes here. Social integration had improved, but nowhere near as much as home integration. Electronic social networking had improved. Um, in some ways, that's because people were were making most of their communication across either their, their, the people who were working with them or their family now, more through electronic social networking. And um, productivity, you can see, has a little bit of a, as a drop, which is not surprising. We'll see that some of these things change as time continues. Remembering that this is our first post-move measure at around six months. We have a very significant and large effect overall on the CIQ, but this effect is very much driven by the positive effect on home integration. That is really having um, real influence in your home, own home, of being able to make those decisions, of being able to, to actually have people come over to visit um, when they want to come over to visit or you want them to come and visit. So a lot of those sorts of issues changed. And again, this is an effect that one would say is you would actually notice it almost every day because of the size of that, of that effect on that measure. So we also, as I said, did an, an exploratory look at what happens with support needs. And we found we didn't use a paired test here. We used a Wilcoxon's test here, which is a non-parametric version of a paired um, test and found that we almost reached significance. So we had a significant, we had a, a, a real trend towards change. And at post move, we found the support level remained the same for five participants, same number of hours per day. It decreased for eight participants and was consistent with lower support needs. And it increased for two participants um, with indicating higher support needs. No participant had a change in support level that exceeded a single level of change on the care and needs scale. These changes in support level reflected an, an overall reduction in daily support hours for the group. So if we consider these 15 people as a group, average support hours per participant pre-move were 19 hours per day. Average support hours per participant post-move had reduced to 16.6 hours per day, which is an average decrease of 2.4 support hours per participant per day. When you add that up, that is a, a significant and substantial cost saving from a support perspective. And particularly given that from the qualitative interviews, there was, um, if anything, a sense of um, a sense of improvement in support that people talked about in their new environment. So as a summary to the findings in this pilot, um, in this pilot study, if we look at the inputs, the impact puts in specialist disability accommodation, and all 15 of these people had moved into individualized apartments, um, anywhere from six to 12 in a new apartment complex, um, in a metropolitan region or regional or large regional city. So they were co-located with respect to support delivery. They could have their own support workers, but there was also 24-hour on-course support. The, there was urban amenity with respect to the location, so they could get to um, public transport. They could um, move from their environment without support to the outside, et cetera. There was accessible design included and smart home technology was included within the, within the environment. And what we can see is there's overall for these 15 people compared, looking at them as a group, increased quality of life, which the health rating is a, is a pretty good um, measure for. 
increase community integration, increase wellbeing and decrease support needs. So promising findings from a pilot perspective, given that it's pilot data. Now, if we have a look and see, does this, does these, do these positive changes hang around? Or is there up and down? All of those sorts of questions. So we did this longitudinal case study, and here we have the first seven participants who have completed pre-move assessment, completed the interview at one year and, and the outcome measures at one year and two years post-move. So we've got um, a range of about nearly three years um, for people looking at what's happening, or well, two years post-move, but getting a sense of how they were pre-move. Same outcome measures, the health rating, well-being, and community integration. Um, and you can see two time points, really, are the, the time points we're interested in, 12 months and two years. What I did here with analysing this was to look at it at an individual level, because seven participants is, is clearly not very many, and to see whether or not the change that, that was experienced on each of those quantitative measures was reliable change. Now, that means that it was well outside, if you like, the, the error range of measurement within the measure. So it wasn't just a bit of variability that you get across measurements. So it indicates that this change represents something that's really happening. Now we did we don't know before we apply the reliable change index whether or not it's going to be positive or negative. But what we do know is if we reach those parameters, that it is change that means something in that person's life. Okay, so again, the demographics of this group, around 44 mean years of age on average, 37 to 59, four females, three males. Cere the disability type for people with cerebral palsy, ABI, other, other neurological disorders and multiple sclerosis. The pre-move living environment for, for this group of seven people, three of them were, were in group homes with less than 10 residents. Um, two were living at home with their parents. One was in residential aged care and 10 were in larger group environments for supervised residential um, living. The support level that we have here is we have four people who are on level two support. That means requiring um, support almost all week. Three, uh, two people with level three support, that means requiring support a few days a week. And one person who needs part of every day and overnight. So results here. So here we're actually looking at firstly, just the group as a whole. And as I said, with seven participants, that's not a lot of people, but certainly gives us some insights into what's happening. And what I wanted to see was kind of exactly what I got to see. And that is this, this sort of, um, if you like, um, increase so blue here is the um the health rating and you can see that particularly from pre-move to 12 months post-move we had the average increasing that's a much better health rating and while it decreases a little bit here um it's still um above the 50 um in that health rating and when i can when you compare that to the mean for the normative Australian population, this mean um, is well within one standard deviation of the normative population, and this mean is true. So that's indicating what we have here is, is, as a small group, a positive change in their health rating. When you have a look here at the wellbeing scale, again, we have um, an increase, which is positive, and we have very little change from 12 months to two years post-move, meaning that this positive change is being held by these participants as a group. If we look at the community integration scale, it's, a much, it's much slower and a much smaller magnitude of change. It does change from pre-move to post-move. 
and that change is held, but it doesn't appear to be continuing to change over time. And I, well, I want to say, and I think the reason that is, is that we need some direct interventions to help, help people become part of their new community. Okay, so if we look at each participant, this is looking at the reliable change. And again, what we're looking at here is the health rating. You can see that participant one actually has a reliable change, but it's in the negative direction. So we have a really high health rating before the person moves, which was higher, it's, it's higher than most of the people in the normative population. So you wonder about the reliability of that rating. Um, and here we're coming back to almost a normative level. So whilst it's a deterioration, we need to actually think about what's causing that. The good part about this study is it also has the qualitative interview so that we could find out that this person was waiting for surgery and was being really frustrated by that. Um, during this period of time. Participant two has a positive change from time one, huge positive change, and a little bit of a reduction again to, to a certain average level at time three at two years. Participant three shows no change, no reliable change in any direction for that. Again, starting off at a reasonable level. Participant four, shows a positive and reliable change from pre-move to post-move 12 months and, and two years. Participant five shows a similar pattern, positive improvement from time one pre-move to 12 months and two years. Missing data here for participant six at time point two, but a whopping change at time point three, which was the two year time point with respect to, to this rating. And for participant seven, there's an increase, but this doesn't go outside of, if you like, the measurement error on that particular measure. So it's not necessarily reliable change at this point. Well-being, again, looking at participants, Participant one shows little change. Um, participant, and you can see that participant one was actually doing relatively well from a well-being perspective. Participant two has a really significant change at time point two and time point three from the point of view of it being reliable change. Um, there's a, 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 po a positive move for participant three but again, this does not reach reliable change outside of error, measurement error. And similarly for participant four, at least in the, in the right direction, participant five shows a reliable change at time two and time three. Um, again, missing data here for, for participant six um, and a positive improvement, but this did not reach reliable change. And participant seven, started off good and pretty much remained feeling pretty positive about their own well-being. Finally, community integration. This is the total score here. Reliable change from time one to time two for participant one. And that clearly came out in their, in their qualitative interview. Um, they were much more integrated within their community and enjoying getting out and about. Again, reliable change here at time point two for participant two, but with a little bit of a reduction. No reliable change for participant three in either direction. For participant four, we get reliable change at time point two and time point three. So we've got this nice gross kind of pattern. No change for participant five. Again, a, a positive um, improvement for participant six, but this did not reach reliability. And again, participant seven, who was doing well and has been doing well on most of these measures, is remaining around the same with a little bit of increase at two years. So let's summarize this. At one year, four of the six people, remember we had one with missing data at one year, had, in, had shown an increase and three of those four 
that increase was reliable improvement on that particular measure. And here we're looking at the health rating. So self-perceived health is improving for those three people. One person showed no change and one person showed deterioration and that was reliable. So there was something happening. And when we look at the interview, we find out, yes, there is something happening. There's a worsening of a health condition. Um, the wellbeing here, three out of six increased, two out of three, that increase was reliable, two out of six, no change. And one out of six showed a decrease, one, one of the people showed a decrease, but that wasn't a reliable deterioration. Community integration, you can see here, four with an increase in their community integration score, three out of four, it was reliable. And the other two of the six that um, we had there had no change. Two years, similar patterns, but we've got an increase, if you like. At two years, five of the seven participants and four of five of those participants showed reliable improvement. Um, two of the seven had decreased and one of those people had sh was showing um, reliable deterioration. Four out of seven increased on the well-being. And again, that's that's an increase in a, in a sense for, for that scale. And two out of four had reliable change. And with respect to the CIQ, five of the seven people had increased, but only two of them had reached a reliable change. And the, the, otherwise there was no change or a decrease that wasn't reliable. So that's all a bit blur, messy. But one of the things that I, I will fly all of our studies or studies that I do are usually mixed methods because talking to people is where you learn about the lived experience. And this is one of the quotes. And I love this quote because it really reflects, I think, what home should be in many ways. Things are much more settled in terms of support work, in terms of, I don't know how to phrase it, just general daily living stuff. You've got the normal stresses that might come with that, but it's not. It's just life now. And when I think about that quote, I think about the phrase, you know, living like everybody else. It's just like life and I'm managing it. And I kind of am getting on with the daily living stuff, which is really important from the point of view of making a move into a new environment. Okay, so implications for future research, I think are that the important things. We need to absolutely afford people with disability the basic right to choose where they live and who they live with. That's that's not questionable in any way, shape or form. What we would like to do is to scale up our data collection and that's what the, the linkage grant is helping us do and include contemporary housing options beyond SDA apartments and we're doing that um, as, as I speak. Um, we want to understand the trajectory of individuals and subgroups of people with diverse disability types so we can maybe be a little bit more predictive and a little bit more supportive from the very beginning of this process. We want to maximize potential for more independence, increase well-being and community participation. And I think one of the, the studies that we've done that I've reported here at LIDS seminar that, that um, Chris and I um, were involved in was the multiple, multiple component community connection program, MCOM Connect, where we found fantastic results. And, and that's a really good example of a of a project that was developed to help people become integrated within their community that I think really applies to this, to people moving into new environments. And I think we would need, really need to be able to identify who is likely to flourish in different models of housing and support tailored to specific needs so that we can, as I say, be a little bit, um, instead of trying to peer into a, a smoky glass ball, be able to actually identify the best pathways for people. I think we do need to develop an evidence base. We need to further investigate cost effectiveness and we're doing that in the linkage grant, um, looking at uh, a social economic evaluation so that we don't only just look at dollars, but we look at social change and what that means. 
And finally, this is another one of my favourite quotes, and this is Helen saying, my life has changed since moving into my apartment. It's just so wonderful to have people coming to my place. It's wonderful to go out with them too, but just to sit down at my table and have a cup of tea or just talk, just talk in a normal environment. It's one of life, life's simple pleasures. I think Helen captures Jane Austen's William Shakespeare's and G.K. Chesterton's thoughts about comfort, happiness and freedom beautifully in her quote. There's a lot of people who have participated in making this research possible. They're all named there. But most of all, I, I want to thank the primary participants and their close others who so generously provided their time to complete the study so far and who continue to pop back up for, for longitudinal um, outcome um, of uh, talking to us again and telling us about their story. The pilot study is published open access um, in disability and rehabilitation. Click on the DOI and you can go straight there. Thank you very much and happy to answer any questions if I haven't talked for too long, Chris. <laughs> no, no. Thank you very much, Jacinta. Um, that's fascinating stuff.